Hello team, welcome to my session and today we're going to cover CCSP exam cram part one. In this session, I'm covering a very high level overview that you must be aware about when you're preparing for the domain one. If you find this video useful and you want me to create another video of other domains, do share your feedback on the comment box of the YouTube. My name is Prab Nair and for more information, you can refer my LinkedIn profile about my certifications and everything. Yes, I am CISSP, CCSP, ISSAP and SSLP along with that some other certifications we have. But I'm not here to discuss about my introduction. We're going to cover about the exam cram of a domain one on a very high level. But I'm sure you must watch this video till the last because there are some areas I have covered in this session which is missing in other textbook. And you must be aware about those things while preparing for this exam. So let's start. So first thing what you need to understand about the cloud computing roles. Cloud computing roles is a very important topic for the CCSP exam. And this cloud provider major activities are also very important, which I could not find in any of the books. Okay, so as per the NIST cloud computing, uh, the cloud providers are organized into five key activities. One is called as a service deployment that you can see in the in the section here. Here the service deployment mean we're talking about the public cloud, private cloud, okay, public cloud, private cloud, community cloud. Then we have a hybrid cloud. So public, private, community, hybrid. These are the type of a deployment models we have. Okay. So we're going to cover in details in my next slide. Then another major activity we have, which is called as a service orchestration. So in service orchestration, it is referred to the arrangement, coordination and management of the cloud infrastructure to provide the optimizing capability of the cloud services as a cost effective way of managing the IT resources, which is dictated by the strategic business requirement. So if uh, these keywords you will find in the exam, remember the answer will be service orchestration. It talking about the arrangement, coordination and management. So we have a three layers uh, for the orchestration. One is called as a service layer here. You can see. One is called as a service layer. Second is called as a resource abstraction layer. And third is called as a physical layer. If you want me to draw it, it is like this way. So we have a three layers service layer. Then second is called as a resource and abstraction layer. And third is called as a physical layer. Okay. So service layer where the cloud provider define and provision the three service model example like we have a SaaS, we have a pass and we have is okay just give me a second so we're talking about the service layer so we talk about SaaS. we have a pass and we have a ias okay so any question talking about the service layer we have a three type of service layer. Second is called as a resource abstraction layer. So a resource abstraction layer is a middle layer. This layer contain the system component that cloud provider use to provide and manage access to the physical computing resources through a software abstraction. You are right in this layer. We have a SDN also. So resource abstraction layer, which is driven by the SDN and your Hyper-V. And third is called as a physical layer. Physical layer include all the physical computing resources. This layer include the hardware resource such as CPU. Okay, so we have a hardware here. We have a CPU. Okay, we have a router, we have a firewalls and everything. So it is also include the facilities resources such as HVAC, communication and other aspect of the physical point. So we have a three layers. Remember, okay, service layer where we're talking about different type of services, resource abstraction layer, a layer which is used to coordinate with lower layers and above layers. So SDN and uh, works on this layer and physical layer is the layer where you can see the physical devices. This layer include the hardware resources such as CPU and memory, network routers, firewalls and everything. So 
Service orchestration does these, these function. They just arrange, they coordinate and manage to provide and support the service layer. Next is called as a cloud service management. So any question talking about the business support, provisioning and configura configuration from the perspective of the portability interoperability requirement, which is more like a customer centric, then the answer is cloud service management because it include all the service related functions, which is necessary for the management and operation of those services required by the proposed to cloud consumer and cloud service con uh, management. So they're basically providing all the services from the perspective of the business support, provisioning and configuration from the perspective of the portability and interoperability requirements. So whatever the customer is basically requesting, one of the role in the cloud computing is understanding the requirement and according to that, providing them portability and interoperability services. So when you're talking about the portability, portability mean shift and lift. It means you're moving from one environment to the another environment. Okay, so you're moving from one environment to the other environment. Whereas the interoperability mean we have a module here one, we have a module two and we have a module three. So this module is parallelly communicating with the both modules. So this is called as an interoperability. It means the module parallelly working with the two environment, whereas the portability is you moving from one environment to the other environment. So sometimes what happen? Customer is there, you, he want to migrate his on-prem application on the cloud. So cloud service management will understand the requirement. And according to that, they will customize that to make sure they should able to achieve their portability and interoperability requirement. Another important thing which cloud provider address is the security. Definitely security is the at most the important thing which cloud provider offer. One thing you need to remember when it comes to public cloud, or any cloud, multi-tenant is the most important concern for any customer we have. Multi-tenant mean your tenant, like example, you're taking a services, so it is a tenant belong to you. So there is a possibility that your data will be shared with the other tenant or it is reside with the other tenant. So there is a possibility if one tenant is compromised or the Hyper-V is compromised, there is a possibility one tenant can able to access the other tenant data. So from a security point of view, the most effective control, we have a encryption. Cloud providers are always providing all the services as per the privacy requirement. Like we, if you're dealing with the Europe, then GDPR is there. If you're dealing in Canada, we have a PIBDA. PIBDA is testable, GDPR is testable. Then recently we have a CCPA which is announced in US. So it is my suggestion when you're preparing for CCSP exam, please do remember about the GDPR penalty, GDPR breach reporting, PIBDA, uh, PIBDA uh, uh, use in which country, or uh, HIPAA use in which countries, and their associate penalties. One thing is that, uh, one scenario I would like to discuss here, suppose you are based out in India, okay, as a customer, and you're using a cloud services of UAE, okay? So customer is based out in India, and the data center is in UAE, which providing a cloud services, okay? So customer is based out in India and data center in UAE. So which uh, law will be applicable for any kind of a data breach? Definitely based on the contract requirement. The answer will be based on the contract requirement. So based on the contract only, we document the liabilities and responsibility. If you ask me primarily, India law need to be applicable, but sometimes cloud provider is not agree on that. So in the initial stage itself, everything need to be documented in the contract. Even the customer in India want the data breach reporting or data breach requirement need to be maintained as per the India law. That also need to be addressed in the contract because contract is the one which drive the relation between the cloud customer and cloud provider. So when we're dealing with the privacy part, uh, law and regulation is the utmost thing we need to consider. So we have a dedicated team for that who manage the privacy, those do, do PIA. PIA is also important for the exam. PIA is a process of identifying the privacy risk associated with the people, process and technology in the cloud providers or the services. So PIA we use to conduct on a regular basis to identify the gap associated with the privacy functions. So these are the major uh, activities we have, which lies with the cloud provider. Thank you. Okay, so next part is cloud computing roles. As a CCSP aspirant, I will recommend you to always uh, remember the difference between the data owner and data custodian. Example, if I am a data owner, as per the value, I will classify the data and I will instruct the data custodian to manage the data on behalf of data owner. 
in a cloud also it is very important for you to understand the data on a data custodian another important thing which you need to remember is called as a data controller and data processor example i am a customer okay i am dealing with the bank and bank is so data subject is there so data subject is going to the bank and bank is hosting his cloud services so here the cloud service we have and here we have a bank so bank in this case will be the data controller and cloud service in this case will be the data processor so you must know the difference between the data the next controller topic and data processor for your information data controller data will aspect. be the ultimate primary accountable for gdpr issues so gdpr as i said reporting breach will be 72 hours penalty you need to remember gdpr principles also you need to understand because this data controller and data processor are the gdpr terms european terms that we use gdpr is applicable for the eu region for the eu citizens and residents so any company who driving any kind of an activity related to the data processing in eu they need to comply with the gdpr which amend these two roles data controller and data processor so in this case bank con collecting a data they are the data controller they are ultimately accountable for gdpr aspects where is a cloud provider is a data processor who manage the data security on behalf of the data controller you also need to understand the difference between the cloud administrator and cloud broker to understand better about the cloud broker i would recommend you to uh, review one uh, document which is called as a iso uh, ic 17788 okay 2014 they have talked about the cloud brokers their multiple roles okay intermediates uh, then we have a segregator intermediate segregator and uh, one more is their aggregators so these are the type of services we have in the cloud broker cloud administrator is the one who manages the end to end activities and services that is deployed on the cloud it is more from a provider role and also from a customer role so you need to understand the difference between the cloud administrator and cloud broker i would recommend you to review the cloud broker that is because cloud broker evaluate evaluate the or evolve the new profile in the market which is called as a casb and casb providing a visibility cloud broker also providing a visibility to the cloud customer so it is very important for you to understand the cloud broker and cloud access security broker services from the data security point of view data center security is also very important and uh, who classify the data who take the backup operation you must be familiar with those terms so this is what we have a cloud computing roles that you should refer now next thing is called as a cloud service category so when you talking about the cloud service category in this section the first part is called as a saas software as a services so saas provide the customer with the least amount of control so one of the least control is basically with in the cloud customer is with the saas only less overhead less administrative task they get a predefined application from the provider he just need to use that example is office 365 office 365 is a best example go to meeting is a best example okay gmail is a best example that is called as a software as a services so saas as i said customer with the least amount of control the greatest level of responsibility for the provider to maintain the security and operational controls which is present in a service uh, saas service category so they are concerned about the application they have deployed they are responsible to configure maintain and update where the customer just have uh, access to the user settings which he can able to manage uh, one more important thing which i would like to add in the saas that client has a limited control of the user specifications okay configuration settings okay and the consumer does not manage or control any kind of a underlying cloud infrastructure which include the network server operating system storage or even the individual application capability okay there will be some possible exceptions we have for the limited user specified application configuration configuration setting which is completely depending on the contract second is called as a platform as a services platform as a services is concerned with the interoperability portability requirement suppose we are planning to migrate our on prem application on the cloud okay so before going any kind of a migration that we doing from on prem to cloud example this is the on prem we have 
we have an on-prem application and we are planning to migrate the on-prem application on the cloud. Cloud providing me platform in which we need to deploy, but make sure we should also understand the interoperability portability that shift and lift is happening. And tomorrow, if the cloud provider exit, do we have another cloud provider which can support us? So make sure you should have a strong contract. Okay. With the cloud provider about the vendor lock-in or vendor lockout, the kind of a support. We always prefer the open API, open data should be used. So tomorrow, if I want to move from one cloud provider to another cloud provider, cloud provider, it is easy to manage because interoperability and portability is always a concern, which is specifically in the past. There is a reason for that because in the SaaS, we don't develop, we get an application. So everything is taken care by the provider in the IAS, we get a machine. So we build from a scratch, but in the past, we get a platform only in which we need to develop the application in which we need to host the application. So interoperability portability is always a concern when it comes to pass. So if question specifically talking about in which case the interoperability and portability concern you need to face. So the answer is basically pass only. So we need to prepare a good contract with the kind of a uh, open API supports or open app, open data support should be there by which, uh, you know, you can able to migrate from one application, one, one platform to other platform from a BCP DR point of view also moving the application from one pass provider to another pass provider is always a concern. Okay. So everything need to be addressed in the contract before doing any kind of a services in a pass environment. And one more important thing as for your due diligence check, do the proper testing, do the testing of an application, see whether it is working effectively. Then only try to migrate, uh, the application from the on-prem to cloud. So cloud provider manages the cloud infrastructure for the platform and consumer have a control over the application and possibly the hosting environment setting. I repeat, consumer have a control over the application and possibly the hosting environment setting. Okay. They don't manage anything. So they just use to manage a uh, hosting environment setting. Third is called as a infrastructure services. It is a services where the user has a most control. Okay. The cloud user has a more control. What provider is providing? Remember the statements processing, which is called as a CPU RAM storage, networking and other equipment. Okay. The client has a control over the OS. Okay. Client can able to run their application. It has a more control over the hosting environment and operating system, but do not manage the physical infrastructure. Okay. So that is the thing. So while customer may attach to the SaaS, and pass category due to the resource saving and reduce the responsibility for administering the cloud environment. They should be aware about these categories also corresponding to the great loss of control of the environment housing that sensitive data. So these services need to be understand. Okay. Because these are quite testable in the exam. Now, when you deal with the cloud provider, there will be some kind of a points you need to consider. The first thing is called as a distinction between the cloud service type and related authority. So the key distinction between the cloud service type and are related to the, how the authority is divided between the customer and provider, which influence the degree of accountability for both parties. It is also depending upon what kind of a service model we have. As I discussed earlier in the IAS customer has a more control, more authority, where in a SaaS it is opposite. So, it is very important that cloud service types are related to the how the authorities are basically influencing and the degree of accountability they're going to drive in their decision function. Second important thing which established the a strong term between the cloud provider and cloud customer is a contract. Everything remember from the exam point of view, any kind of a security issues need to be addressed. Who is responsible for what data? which law will be applicable, what kind of a governance services we have, everything will be driven by the contractual agreement. So contractual agreement and ongoing due diligence become especially critical where the controls are basically outsourced. So cloud contracts or contractual agreement is act like a third party governance between the cloud provider and cloud customer. It is also very important to have a line of transparencies and liabilities, which will be vary depending upon the cloud provider type and implementation models. And all those things need to be regulated by the contractual binding agreements because you want your data to be localized in India. Providers say that I'm not comfortable. So it will create a lot of conflict to so make sure to build the transparency and liability 
provider always or customer always promote need to be document all the parameter in the contract so contract will be established to establish the transparency and liability between the service model and service provider and cloud provider until unless things are not documented in the contract no one will take any kind of a decision so transparency liability you want so it can be driven through a contract next part is called as a cloud deployment now next thing is called as a cloud deployment so in the cloud deployment as we have a four type of deployment model the first is called as a public cloud public cloud so public cloud is a uh, infrastructure which is provision for open use by the general public it may be own manage and operate by a business or academic government organization okay so that is called as a public cloud a pu cloud services which is available for selling the services okay which is used for general public so that is called as a public cloud second is called as a private cloud private cloud is provision for exclusive use of a single organization i repeat single s i n g l e single organization comprising the multiple consumers it may be own or manage or operate by the organization or sometime it managed by a third party private cloud actually two type private cloud is basically two type one is called build and one is called buy one is called build and one is called buy so when you talking about build or buy uh build is mean build from a scratch you know you have invested your data center resources people and everything or buy is basically you taking a services like amazon is providing a private cloud services they clearly say that boss you can take my services we will provide you everything as per requirement dedicated server we will provide sla customization we will provide contract we will provide Con contract will be customized we will provide but data and server we will kept with us okay you so if my requirement is governance okay if my requirement is governance if my requirement is governance if my requirement is the data security if my if my requirement is data control okay data control so if my requirement is data control if my requirement is governance if my requirement is data security i will definitely go for the private cloud okay so private cloud is the second deployment model we have the third is called as a hybrid so hybrid is a combination of a two okay two or more distinct cloud infrastructure like private community or private public which remain unique unique entities but are bound together by the standardized or proprietary technology that enable the data and application portability example like uh, i'm taking example of a hybrid with the reference of public and private cloud so company has their in house data center this is the in house data center okay we able to use 99% of the resource example now after some period of time we able to use this resources 100% so right now my entire 100% data center was utilized for my cloud services so what i did i basically use my public cloud okay i use the public cloud so i have my data center which is a in house which is a private cloud but i was able to use the 99% of the resource okay so there will be a one condition come which is called as a cloud busting because here i was able to utilize my 99% of the resources so i want to distribute the load okay to avoid cloud busting so if cloud burst i want the load to be shared with the other cloud infrastructure so here i am using a public cloud for that that is the one scenario so this is how these two cloud providers work together to provide the common services second scenario is because of lockdown on covid the load has been increased on data center so in that case i can use my public cloud for the load sharing the third example is i am a application development organization i does my all coding and everything in the private cloud once the applications ready i deployed that in a public cloud that can be accessed for everyone because if i do the development on my public cloud my access source code is accessible to everyone so to overcome that 
I basically develop the coding in house and publish the code on the public cloud. So this is what is happened in the case of hybrid. So hybrid here used for the BCP hybrid here. We can use for the load balance hybrid is there. We use for cloud busting, but what you need to understand from the slavers point of view is hybrid cloud is the only cloud where we have a requirement of portability, interoperability, open API, because you might going to uh, share your application with the third party cloud provider and to share your application with third party cloud provider portability interoperability is a primary requirement open data is the primary requirement not in the public and private because public is provided by the common company we are using their services so we have a dependency on them in the private it is our own but in the hybrid not only we are hosting infras in house but sometimes we have to deploy it on the public clouds because we are using a combination of a two so proprietary load balancing portability interoperability is a primary concern when you deal with the hybrid cloud so we do testing before forming the hybrid cloud and last is called as a community cloud community cloud is basically a cloud infrastructure provision for the exclusive use by the specific community of a consumer from the organization that have a shared concern like mission security requirement policy and compliance consideration so one example is sony sony is providing the private cloud to the small small gaming companies under the license that okay tomorrow you're going to develop any game it will be launched under the playstation and the example microsoft is start offering the gaming platform to other third party small gaming companies and they mutually license like agreement the sign that okay if you're planning to launch any kind of a games it will be come under the microsoft agreement in india also we have a indian bank council where two three banks has come up together for the cloud services so community cloud where the group of companies don't have a budget to go for a dedicated private cloud neither they do they neither they want to go for a public cloud so they did the mutual investment together and all that they come with their own infrastructure so that is called as a community cloud okay so it may be own managed and operate by one or more of the organization in a community or third party or some combination of them which may exist on on and off premises this community cloud come with the combination of the common concerns such as mission security requirement policy and compliance consideration so these are the four deployment we have the concern happen of data in a public cloud but more restricted control of the data happen in the private cloud bcp or dr point of view if the question talking about portability if they talking about interoperability talking about answer is hybrid cloud because that is a primary consideration we have in the hybrid next is called as a essential character so cloud essential characteristics whenever we go for any cloud provider we always look at some major characteristics in the cloud provider and based on that we we finalize the cloud provider so we are expecting these are the characteristics must be there in the cloud provider so the first characteristics is called as a on demand self services on demand self service mean where the consumer provision the resources from the pool using a on demand self service they manage their resources themselves without having to talk to the human administrator example i open a portal of aws or azure i can launch instance i can upgrade the instance i can able to upgrade the storage so it is a very uh, fascinating uh, things for the customer okay he doesn't need to depend on anyone because if we talk about the traditional time if system is down i need to call help desk and i have a dependency on that but now instance is there application interface is there web interface is there from which you can upgrade your machine downgrade your machine upgrade your storage downgrade your storage upgrade your services without having a dependency of the physical human administrator ha ah, in a worst case if you need some kind of a help you can raise the ticket also that is possible but this give more freedom to the cloud consumer okay by which they can able to manage their machines easily but this bring the governance issue now just imagine we have a 400 users if we if we think from on demand self services if these 400 users if these 400 users sending their request for upgrade and all that we don't have any control over there so governance is the biggest concern we have in the on demand because different different users launching their own instances upgrading their own, own instances it has a direct or indirect billing impact financial impact overall functional impact on the organization so on demand self service somehow is advantageous we want that but from a governance issue it is a concern okay second is called as a 
broad network access it mean the capability are available over the network and access through a standard mechanism that promote the use by the heterogeneous thin or thick client performs platforms example we have a mobile phones from where you can access your cloud services tablet you can access from a cloud services workstations so you are access your cloud services from anywhere so from a bcp point of view it is an advantage in the case of your primary data center is down and you want to access the services from home so service will be available whenever it required and location has no restrictions so from a bcp from a backup continuity this is the most important characteristics i will be interested to check in the cloud provider which is called as a broad network access it mean it is available from anywhere third is called as a resource pooling cloud provider has a pool of resource that is why they able to provide me whenever and whatever is required so provider computing resources are pooled to serve the multiple consumer using a multi tenant model with a different physical and virtual resources which is dynamically assign and reassign according to the consumer demand because of the pool of resource we can able to achieve the scalability okay because of the resource pooling we can able to achieve the elasticity okay because of the resource pooling we able to meet the customer demands okay and this is how and they managing this pool with the help of virtualizations and everything but one concern is there a resource pooling is that your data is going to be pool or your data is going to be shared with the other customer data because we talking about pooling here pool of cpu pool of ram pool of storage okay we have a logical segmentation but we have no visibility about how they organizing and store the data so one concern we have in the resource pooling about the data sharing or data disclosures that is where the most effective control we have is encryption okay so resource pooling is great from a redundant point of view from a scalability point of view but from a data security point of view it's a concern even the bcp point of view if i'm using cloud as a secondary site resource pooling is a most important thing i am looking forward in a cloud provider next is called as a rapid elasticity where the capability can be rapidly and elastically provision in some cases automatically scale rapidly outward and inward with the demand so to the consumer the capability available for provisioning often appear to be unlimited and can be appropriate in any quantity at any time that is comes with the rapid elasticity rapid elasticity mean today i need a 2 gb so it is available tomorrow i need 4 gb it is available tomorrow i want to withdraw 2 gb i can do that provider is using a virtualization that is why they able to offer me rapid elasticity if they are providing me dedicated hardware it is fixed for me i cannot scaled up and scaled down because because right now we have a dedicated physical server so now what happen is they have a pool of servers which is configure and manage through a virtualization and because of the virtualization they can able to meet my requirement dynamically okay so for rapid elasticity to be achieved we need a redundant architecture we need a redundant servers okay and virtualization to meet our requirement so rapid elasticity is a most most important thing from a bcp cloud point of view if i'm using a cloud provider as a bcp site rapid elasticity is a most important thing just now i want a immediate upgrade my infrastructure they can do that because provider has a rapid elasticity feature but without resource pooling rapid elasticity will not work okay so rapid elasticity also required the resource pooling next is called as a measure services so cloud system automatically control and optimize resource used by the metering capability okay we talk about the metering capability metering capability how much i use i can pay for it live example uber you book the uber cab uber is also cloud for us they have a pool of cab you can book any point of time with the help i don't need to depend upon anyone that is called on demand okay you can access your uber from anywhere broad network they have a pool of cars okay i can book multiple car if i want and whatever i use they give me billing so after one month we have a proper planning okay i have invested this much amount of money okay so based on this i can do this forecasting same like when provider providing me services along with that he providing me the metering services which give me the visibility about how much i use 
So resource usage can be monitored, controlled and reported, providing a transparency for both provider and consumer of the utilized services. So that is called as a metering services. One important point you need to understand from the exam point of view, which I have seen a couple of students get confused whenever if you want to achieve the elasticity, we need a virtualization and scalability. Without virtualization and scalability, you can't achieve the rapid elasticity. And without resource pooling, rapid elasticity, you cannot able to achieve. Because elasticity driven from the pool of hardware and without resource pooling, the things will not work. So next topic, we have storage and security. In this section, we're going to discuss about uh, the type of service and associate with the storage. We already covered the service model. And now we need to understand the different type of storage, which is associate uh, with the each service model. So if you can see the IAS infrastructure as services, it has two type of storage, volume storage and object storage. Uh, for your information, storage types are very important for CCSP exam. Okay, so while you're preparing for the CCSP, uh, make sure you should not miss this topic, especially their usage, their benefits. Why should we go for volume storage and why should we go for object storage? If you take example, volume storage is just like a virtual hard drive. You know, we have a hard drive which is connected with the machine. And from there you form the partitions and create a storage, create a storage and store the data in that. So that is the example of the volume storage. So volume is a hard drive, a virtual hard drive that can be attached to a virtual machine and utilized similar to the physical hard drive. So all configuration, formatting, usage, file system level security are handled by the particular operating system of the host VM and by the administrator of the host system. So if you ask me, uh, volume storage provide the better performance, okay? The volume storage we are using for the database since the database required the consistent IO performance and low latency connectivities. So this can be the good option uh, from that point of view. So yes, moral of the story is that it used to process data a bit faster because data store in a blocks. Second, we have a object storage. Okay, object storage. Um, it's also called as a file storage that can be accessed directly through an API. Example like we just have a uh, we have a folder like this way example give me a second so we just creating uh, we have a folder like this what we did we just upload the file on that and when I upload the file it will create one URL for that so whenever I want to access the file I will directly hit this URL and by which I will able to access the file object storage as compared to volume storage take some time to process the information. Why? Because in the volume storage, what happened? We have a blocks, block one, block two, block three, block four. So when I load a file, it is load by retrieving all the blocks. So it is easy for load in a very small level, but in the object, whatever the file we have, we directly call for same file on the same time. So it will take some time for loading. That is why we used to say that performance issues are there with the object storage. It takes time time to load and process the file where in the volume storage, it doesn't take much time to load the file because data is organized in small, small blocks. So performance issues is there. answer is object storage, better performance. The answer is volume storage. The next thing is, uh, uh, uh object storage also have a large data sets, whether you're performing a pharmaceutical or financial data or a multimedia file such as photo videos you want to store in a particular format so you can retrieve any point of time we can prefer the object storage it is like you know whatever the state of data you have stored in a same state you can able to retrieve okay that is why it takes some time for loading now when it comes to pass in the pass we have a two type of storage structure and unstructured so structured data when you're talking about structured data is an information that is highly organized, categorized and normalized. I repeat, structured data is organized. The word itself say organized, uh, categorized and third normalized. So we use this word in the SQL database. Okay. So this type of data is able to place on a uh, traditional relational database model. Okay. So we creating the, uh, database table here and we store data 
in that particular table so that is called as a structure so rdbms is a best example of the structured database unstructured is a big data it means if the file is uh, example like one movie okay it will store in a same movie format if the file is audio it will store in audio format so sql is the popular example of the structured but unstructured data is the information that cannot be easily organized and formatted for use in a rigid data structure like database audio file word documents and all that okay make sure you understand the difference in structure and unstructured their usage make sure you understand the difference between the object and volume storage which is used with the is and the next is called as a sas software as a services they have a multiple type of storage which is called as a information storage and management content file storage fe formal cdn and raw storage and long term storage so sdn cdn is basically highly required in the sand because data must be available as soon as possible from the nearest server accessibility is a primary requirement in the sas so that is why cdn is a support services we use in a sas sas sorry okay software as a services the next topic we have called storage encryption the storage type which is defined in the different service model is quite testable their encryption is also quite testable in the exam so most of the questions or you can see most of the topics are are testable on the base on encryption parameters because cloud demand encryption because in the cloud we have a data and data required security and most important way to protect the data in the cloud is encryption only so we have a encryption here which is categorized based on the service model one is called as a volume storage encryption second is encryption which is happening on the object level and the third the encryption happening on the database level so if you can see here on the volume level okay we have a two things proxy based encryption and instance based encryption so proxy based encryption where the proxy based encryption is used the encryption engine is reside on the proxy instance itself okay so it is basically at the instance location okay so they will they they can basically validate your testing concept by asking by asking i am not sure but they can ask that encryption engine reside where so encryption engine is basically reside in the instance location see encryption engine is basically a component which use the key to process the data without engine you cannot process the encrypted data or without engine you cannot able to encrypt and decrypt the data so engine is required which consume the key by which it encrypt and decrypt the data so proxy based encryption okay uh, where the encryption engine is reside on the proxy instance or appliance the proxy instance is a secure machine that handle all kind of a cryptography action include the key management storage so it is same like we have a file here example we have a uh proxy here and then we have a user so whenever user want to access it going through proxy from proxy is basically process the key and then it able to access the file okay but it slow down the performance so that is the thing we have in the proxy based encryption where the inst where the encryption engine reside at the instance location second is called as a instance based encryption instance based encryption where the instance encryption engine is reside in the instance itself but the key is guard locally but it should be managed external to the instance so that is called as a object so that is called as a volume storage encryption now the next thing is is called as a object storage encryption okay object storage encryption in the object storage we have a two type of encryption one is called as a file level and one is called as a application level now file level in, uh, encryption example like irm and drm solution definitely user control the key and everything user encrypt the data and upload on the storage level so encryption engine is commonly implemented at the client side like i will install the drm agent on my laptop i will encrypt with the drm and then i upload so here the moral of the story here is encryption engine reside with the client so client has a more control over the data where is the application level encrypt uh, encryption the encryption engine reside in the application that utilize the object storage so here the encryption engine reside on the application level then third is called as a 
database encryption in the database encryption we have a three type of encryption one is called as a transparent encryption one is called as a application level encryption and one is called as a file level encryption so transparent encryption which is ideally used for database okay so many database management system contain the ability to encrypt the entire database or a specific portion such as table which is used to provide the effective protection from a media theft backup system intrusion and certain database and application level attack in this case encryption engine reside in the database itself so we call for the key consumed by the database and then it encrypt and decrypt the data second is called as application level encryption where the application level encryption the encryption in reside at the application that is utilizing the database and third is called as a volume level encryption where the encryption engine reside within a volume level okay which is also providing a protection from media theft so volume level encryption is controlled by the cloud provider okay so these are the different type of encryptions we have which we need to understand so now we need to understand the data aspect it is very important for you to understand the csu sad which is called as a create store use share archive and destroy this is a life cycle and in each and every life cycle what are the function we have that you need to understand how to destroy data in the cloud we use crypto shedding we first encrypt the data then we upload then we directly delete the encrypted data from the cloud and then we delete the key so this is called as a crypto shedding because we don't have a physical destruction mechanism to be used in the third party cloud provider so only thing is left is encrypt the data upload always and directly delete the encrypted data from a cloud provider and then we destroy the key second is called as a cloud data life cycle you must be review and understand about each and every phase because that is testable in the exam the next is called as a cloud provider we call that as a data processor and cloud user is a data controller i already give the example of that dlp required in a share and use stage dlp and various right management pack pa uh, packages are utilized to either detect the additional sharing or attempt to prevent the modification so whenever we sharing the data dlp can restrict the data but most effective control as compared to dlp we have a drm why there is a possibility that uh, suppose this is the machine we have and this is the dlp we have now there is a possibility that user able to download the data okay from the instance by hook and crook so in that case dlp is basically bypass and file is located on the attacker machine so when he double click on the file still he unable to open the file it required the internet connection so whenever we try to open any file okay unauthorized files and all that when you try to open sometime it ask for internet connection sometime it ask for the username password sometime you need to maintain the consistent session or username password authenticate session there because once you discard the internet the file also automatically get closed so that is what drm so here the hacker was able to download the file so dlp is failed and file get resided in a particular system still we able to maintain the persistent security still we able to maintain the persist persistent security on the data level even it is basically reside anywhere so dlp with drm providing a most effective security in the data sharing and data use stage so dlp required in a share and use okay when you're trying to copy some data when you try to share so dlp can able to restrict we need to pay particular attention to the regulatory requirement whenever you classifying the data we cannot bypass the regulatory law is the top most thing drm apply to distribution side to protect the intellectual and more effective than dlp okay it is used to protect the intellectual properties example like copyright materials i already discussed right so i encrypt the files and everything now there is a hook and crook user was able to download the file and the file get located or reside in any unauthorized system still that person will not able to read anything because drm can remotely control the access management of the file any user you try to open that it always ask for the internet connection it ask for the password so even it bypass all the control still drm maintain the level of security and persistence of the control where the file get downloaded so drm that is why apply to the distribution side to protect the intellectual property and more effective than the dlp data should be destroyed according to retention policy okay 
because if the data need to be written for, written for seven year, it is your liability. If data retained for 10 year, it is your liability. So data need to be destroyed as per the data retention policy. And during a creation phase, we classify the data, always remember. And during the creation phase only, we modify the data. So when you deal with the multiple data in the cloud environment, we also need to consider the performance. So we have a three type of techniques which used to improve the data performance in the cloud. First is called as a data dispersion. It is an integral feature of the cloud architecture and contribute to data security and redundancy by ensuring that copy of the data persists, even entire data center location is destroyed. So data dispersion is a technique which provide the high availability assurance and performance like a RAID only where the data was dispersed across a multiple data center. Second is called as a bit splitting. Bit splitting mean first we encrypt and then we separate into pieces and send across the multiple cloud providers or multiple zones. It, it create a performance issues. It impact the performance issues because first we encrypt, then split and store across the multiple locations. So data dispersion is a technique and bit splitting is the actual concept that we follow. Okay. And the third, we have a eraser coding. Eraser coding is used like a parity only. So I have a couple of uh, students has asked me about the erasure coding, how it works like. So example like, uh, if you take example of the traditional RAID method, we have a disk one, we have a disk two. Okay, so data was stripe across two disk. Okay, so we have a third disk used for parity value. So 000, 110, 101, 110. So this is the parity value. So with the help of this parity value, so if this disk is crashed, still with the help of parity value, I can able to restore the data. Parity used for integrity and accuracy. So 0, 0 is 0, 1, 0 is 1, 1, 1 is 0, 1, 0 is 1. So I was able to recover the data. I was able to recover the data which got deleted. So same thing we have a erasure coding. So we have a zone one, we have a zone two, we have a zone three, we have a zone four. So data was split across this one, this one, and this one. So parity value store in this. So with the help of parity value, I can able to restore the rest of the data. So erasure coding use a parity bit to recover the missing data like a RAID parity. So if you have a four zones, one copy here, one copy here, one copy here, and one copy here. In one copy, we have a parity value. So parity value store about what are the other copies we have. So with the help of that, we can able to recover the deleted data. So eraser coding is just like a parity only, which is used to improve the data governance and functions. So data dispersion is a concept which providing availability, assurance and performance. We achieve through a bit splitting where they split the data. Okay. And first we encrypt, then we split and then we store across a multiple region to avoid single point of access. Erasure coding is a basically technique which is used to maintain the parity value. If data was right across three zones, another three zone or two zone will basically maintain the parity. So with the help of parity, I can able to recover the lost data. So these are the techniques we use to improve the data performance. I'm sure you find this session useful. For more information, if you want, uh, you can drop uh, a comment, uh, drop your sections in a comment box details. And if you find this view is uh, great and all that, do share your feedback in the YouTube comment. So based on that, I will try to make some more videos on the domain three and domain four. I'm, I went very fast because I just want to share you the high level exam cram of the domain one. Thank you team.